This thing has been in our homes for almost a hundred years now. I'm talking, of course, of the humble refrigerator. Sure, today's models have water dispensers, touch screens, and smart features, but inside, it's the same cooling tech we've been using for generations. At its core, a heat pump with gas and compressors. But what if I told you your next fridge might not need any of that? Instead, it could run on these magnets. So how does it even work? And what are the benefits? Let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky, and this is Tupa Da Vinci. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. A fridge cooled with magnets sounds like sci-fi, right? But it's very real and a proven technology based on something known as the magnetocaloric effect. So we'll start with that. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive in the physics, but I promise I'll keep it short. Now, here's just a quick refresher. You might remember from high school chemistry that metals are made of atoms. At high temperatures, these atoms aren't just sitting still. They're constantly moving and spinning. So their tiny magnetic orientations are naturally pointing in random directions in a chaotic spin. But all that changes when you turn on a magnetic field. When that happens, the chaos turns to order. Magnetic spins line up like soldiers in formation. Magnetic entropy, which is the measure of disorder, goes down. To compensate and to follow the second law of thermodynamics, the material gets warm. Then take the magnetic field away and order turns back into chaos. Atoms scramble again, entropy rises, and the material starts to cool. So magnetize, the metal heats up. Demagnetize, and the metal cools down. That's the gist of it. German physicist Emma Warburg in 1881 thought, what if I magnetize the metal to heat it up, cool it down with the magnet on until it's almost ambient temperature, and then demagnetize it to cool it down further? It should get colder than ambient temperature. So then when it's cold, I stick it inside a fridge and let it suck out the heat from it until it gets back into its initial temperature. And then of course you rinse and repeat, just like a gas and compressor powered heat pump. And just like that, you have yourself a cooling cycle. No harmful chemicals, no compressors, and yet you can cool things down with magnets and a metal like gadolinium. And that is the magnetocaloric cooling cycle. You may be wondering, why haven't we been using this since like forever? Here's the thing. It's not that easy to find a material that would work well as a magnetocaloric material. And that'll be clear here in a moment. So I did some research to find out what makes a good magnetocaloric material. Let's call them MCMs for short. You need a material that can heat up a lot and cool down a lot when you magnetize and demagnetize it. That range is important, otherwise the effect is so small. Also, magnetocaloric cooling works best around something called the material's Curie temperature. The Curie temperature, or Curie point, is a temperature at which certain magnetic materials switch from being ferromagnetic to paramagnetic, so from highly ordered to more chaotic. It's basically a phase change, but going from one magnetic phase to another instead of going from liquid to gas, for example. So what happens near that temperature? You get a massive change in magnetic properties with a small change in temperature or magnetic field, which makes the cooling effect stronger. Different MCMs have different Curie points. Gadolinium has a Curie point of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, manganese 113, and nickel 669. Keep these numbers in mind as they play an important role here in a minute. Okay, now we're done with the physics. Let's put on our engineering hats. How do you build a refrigerator with these MCM materials? Spoiler alert, it's not as simple as strapping a magnet to a metal plate. As we saw a minute ago, the magnetocaloric cycle consists of heating parts as well, so you need to precisely use the cooling and shun the heat. The challenge here is that unlike in a normal fridge where you can pump the refrigerant around in a liquid or gas, you can't pump magnetocaloric materials to move heat around because they're solid. It takes a lot of clever engineering to figure out how to magnetize and demagnetize a metal like gadolinium while adding and removing heat from it. The solution was to use a rotating magnet that moves over the gadolinium, cycling it through the heating and cooling phases. Then comes the clever part, piping. A couple of pipes are integrated with a special porous column of gadolinium. Water or another heat transfer fluid is passed through one end during the cooling cycle and the other during the heating cycle. The water that passes during the cooling cycle is then circulated through the fridge to cool it down by passing it through a heat exchanger. A lot of the topics we cover are counterintuitive or not immediately obvious. You know what's really not obvious? How exposed your personal information is online. It's why I've been a member of our sponsor, Delete Me, for two years now. Delete Me is a hands-free subscription service that'll remove all your personal information that's being sold online. And it's not just a one-time scan. 
Just look at all these listings that have been reviewed each quarter and how the amount of exposed data is going down over time. I just got my eighth quarterly report and Delete Me has scanned over 2,300 listings. And it's just amazing to see how the amount of data being exposed just keeps going down over time. And remember, Delete Me isn't just for you. There's family plans so you can protect your entire family and keep all of their data safe because we all have a lot on our minds and your privacy probably doesn't come up very often. It's why I let Delete Me stay vigilant and do all the work so I don't have to think about it. Have you ever heard the expression, if something is free, you're the product being sold? So join Delete Me and save 20% on all plans with my code Ricky. Links in the description. Huge thanks to Delete Me and you. Now back to the show. Now, one tricky thing here is in a magnetocaloric fridge, cooling has to be timed very precisely. You have to time the precise moment when gadolinium is demagnetized and its temperature drops. That's the sweet spot, or rather the cold spot. And that is when the water needs to flow through it. But there's a catch. The magnet is rotating continuously. So if it passes over gadolinium before the water passes or when it's flowing in the opposite direction, you've missed your shot. It's like a perfectly choreographed play with millisecond level coordination between rotating magnets and valves directing the water flow. As for the heated water, a heat exchanger dissipates the heat from it into the atmosphere, just like your fridge does through the back. The process is known as active magnetic regeneration. The result? A fridge that cools things down with no compressor, no gas, and no vibrations, and virtually no noise. But I'm sure there's one thing you're all thinking about, especially if you watch our videos and love heat pumps like we do, and that's performance. And there's some good news there. What I like most about this topic is that magnetocolor cooling isn't just a lab experiment. It's a race with several companies already producing commercial magnetic fridges. Magnatherm, great name for a company, is pioneering the magnetic refrigerator. Based out of Germany, the company has launched its flagship product, Polaris, a beverage cooler using magnetocaloric cooling that can cool drinks down to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Magnatherm has raised over 6 million euros in funding to scale up production. Magnoric, a French company, is developing cooling solutions that use up to 50% less electricity than traditional gas compressor refrigerators. With 20 plus patents, this company is leading innovation in this space. Camfridge, based out of the UK, has developed a prototype net zero magnetic cooling system that cools things down to a temperature of 39 degrees Fahrenheit. They use an iron-based magnetocaloric material that also eliminates the use of rare earth elements. That's one of the technology's toughest challenges, but we'll get back to that here in a minute. But what about performance? If you're wondering about the cooling power, most magnetocaloric refrigerators under testing offer temperatures as low as 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius. Among them is Magnetherm's Eclipse, which is a commercial magnetocaloric fridge offering temperatures as low as 48 degrees. Magnetherm's Polaris, on the other hand, offers a minimum temperature of 41 degrees. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. Yes, I'm aware Celsius is a better system. Let's, let's move past that, okay? So then we couldn't build freezers, could we? So how do these companies compare to traditional commercial fridges available today? Well, most of the ones that we use at home or at work go down to about 35 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit, on the fridge side, with freezer temperatures around zero degrees Fahrenheit. Commercial fridges go as low as negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So normal fridges can go down lower, especially on the freezer side. So what makes this story such a big deal? Well, the old fridge of yours is hiding something ugly under the hood. Chemicals that directly or indirectly contribute to global warming. And I don't mean that from a thermodynamic sense. I mean, those things run on hydrofluorocarbons or HCFs. These are gaseous refrigerants that are great for cooling your fridge's interior, but they're potent greenhouse gases that may eventually make their way into the atmosphere through either leaks or faulty valves or improper dumping or recycling of old fridges. And when I say potent greenhouse gas, I mean it. HCFs have over a thousand times more global warming potential than CO2. R134A, a very popular refrigerant, for example, has a global warming potential of 1,430. 1,430 times more potent than CO2, which would be a value of one. So one kilogram of R134 can trap as much heat as 1.43 metric tons of CO2. And it can linger in the atmosphere for 14 years. The good news is that magnetocaloric fridges save us from all these nasty problems since they have zero ozone depleting potential, zero direct global warming potential, zero risk of refrigerant leak because refrigerant is 
solid. Now, that's all great. But the key to making this commercially viable is going to be the efficiency. That's what can take this tech and make it mainstream. The U.S. Department of Energy puts the energy savings for magnetocaloric refrigerators at around 30%. Companies like Magnetherm, which are at the forefront of this revolution, put this number closer to 40. And that French startup we talked about suggests a target of 50% improved efficiency. That can add up a lot over a period of 15 years, the usual lifespan of a refrigerator. But how much does that translate to in the real world? With a conventional fridge pulling around 17,000 kilowatt hours of electricity annually and electricity prices at around 35 cents per kilowatt hour, a magnetic magnetic fridge can save you almost $2,400 every year. Now, don't get overly excited just yet because these things are expensive and we'll get back to that. But there's some things that I like a lot. Traditional refrigerators operate a compressor at high speed, usually around 1800 RPMs. The compressor, fans, and refrigerant flowing often contribute to a humming that can produce rattling noises. And you know what I'm talking about when your fridge kicks on, everybody can kind of tell. The noise level can go all the way up to 75 decibels in some cases, especially for older refrigerators. Magnetocaloric refrigerators, they ditch the compressor entirely. The result, a much quieter fridge. But of course, there's always a trade-off. Number one, the one you're probably thinking, yes, the price tag. Let's address the elephant in the room. Magnetocaloric fridges aren't cheap. To try to understand just how much more expensive, let's compare apples to apples. A conventional commercial fridge, like the one you would find at a convenience store or grocery store, costs around $2,500 to $5,000. A magnetherm unit can cost upwards of 50,000 euro with a target price eventually when they scale up production of around 20000 That's a 10 to 20 times higher price than conventional refrigerators and 5 to 10 times higher prices for the company if they eventually get to full-scale production. So why the heck would anyone buy such an expensive fridge? Well, for the exact same reason you would buy a more expensive EV instead of an ICE car if you plan on saving money from lower fuel costs over time. Let's look at the best case scenario if Magnetherm was able to bring the price down to $22,500 and worst case scenarios considering the present price of their fridges. So if and when companies like Magnetherm start mass production, the break even of a magnetic refrigerator could be just seven to eight years away or sooner. Considering the current cost, however, it's roughly 17 years. If you zoom out, the commercial magnetocaloric fridge over a typical 15-year lifespan can save up to $28,000 in total operating cost. That means the magnetocaloric fridge can pay for itself in just seven to eight years if they can reach economies of scale. But here's the thing, actually two things. First, those savings, they're for commercial use cases, not for the average household fridge. That's still too expensive to result in any real world savings. Second, the math only works if manufacturers like Magnetherm succeed in scaling production and slashing prices to a third of what they are today, down from 50000 or 60000 down to around 20000 which is their goal. At present prices, the break-even is way too long at the 17-year mark, and it just wouldn't make sense for companies to make that kind of investment. But there's hope and precedent. Remember solar panels? Their prices dropped by 90% in the last 10 years just because of scaling up production. The same goes for refrigerators. The very first refrigerators were only for the ultra wealthy because the technology wasn't commercialized. All the subcomponents and all the economies of scale hadn't been reached. But technology has a way of solving that. And that kind of ties into the second challenge, which is supply chain bottlenecks. Because they need magnets and magnetocaloric materials, magnetic fridges require rare earth materials. Neodymium, dysporium, Gadolinium. These create a problem with supply chains and demand, like we've discussed several times in other videos whenever materials come up. Material science and engineering breakthroughs are huge. They change what we can do in our world. But of course, it comes down to the raw source material. Do you have enough of it? Do we have enough lithium for electric vehicles? Do we have more sodium? Should we make sodium ion batteries? These are the material science considerations that always play a role in breakthroughs like this. Even without magnetocaloric fridges going mainstream, current neodymium demand has already outstripped supply. So there's no way we'd have enough of it to meet another use case. And gadolinium reserves, they can only cover 25% of the entire demand. And then there's the challenge of geopolitics and the fact that China dominates supply chains of rare earth elements. 
about 60% of the mining output, and 87% of the refined supply. With the world the way it is today and trade wars going on, that's going to make this really challenging. Companies like Magnetherm are tackling this issue by developing lanthanum iron silicon alloys to replace gadolinium altogether. But supply chains aren't the only issue. Magnetocaloric materials such as gadolinium exhibit their cooling effect only within a very narrow temperature range centered around their Curie temperature. For gadolinium, their Curie point stands at 69.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that gadolinium is most effective for magnetocaloric applications that require cooling only near room temperature. Its efficacy drops significantly as the temperature moves below 5 degrees Celsius. That's why researchers are exploring composite materials and alloy combinations with different Curie temperatures. The aim is to broaden the temperature range. At its core, magnetocaloric cooling, I think, is coming. But the challenges left are foundationally centered around material science. It's actually a lot like superconducting materials like we've seen in the past. We've seen different alloys that people are building. We went to CERN, by the way, link in the description to that video, where we met with their entire superconductor magnetic team and how they build them and the challenges that they go through. But this is one of those things that if we're going to build this and replace refrigerators on a volume scale, the materials have to be present. The supply chains have to be there and the temperature ranges and the functionality have to be broad enough for commercial viability. And that's where this technology currently is probably still in its infancy. Stay tuned for material science breakthroughs. That's why we cover these topics so often. Material science is one of my favorite topics of engineering. It, it, it unlocks what we can do. And by the way, AI is actually helping to more quickly create new alloys and new test samples to be able to make these breakthroughs more quickly. So don't be surprised if the next five years are a renaissance for material science. I really think that might happen. But what do you think? How interesting and how excited should you be for this technology, and how optimistic are you about it? Sound off in the comments below. So if you like this video, check out this one next that we think you'll also like. And until next week, I'm Ricky with Tipa Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.